Hello there and welcome to a slightly different type of video on the Axos YouTube channel where we'll be discussing the construction of some of the world's most iconic landmarks in project management terms. And we're calling it built on project management. To begin, we're going to talk about the Golden Gate Bridge. Now the Golden Gate Bridge is a perfect example of American innovation and vision. And although construction ended a very long time ago, the project and the engineers involved were so far ahead of their time that there's still a lot of lessons that we can take away from their project management approach today. We can even draw parallels between their ways of working and what is considered best practice today. Now the techniques and approach that I'm going to be discussing today are all taken from effective project management, the PRINCE2 method, which is essentially a collection of decades of experience in project management distilled down into one how-to guide. And when we look back at iconic projects like the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, it's easy to see how the project management best practice that was implemented there eventually evolved into PRINCE2. So let's look at the background of the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge to start with. In 1916, the idea of a bridge spanning the Golden Gate Strait was already one that had been around for a long time. Because a bridge would allow movement between Marin County and San Francisco, which at the time was only possible via ferry. And while the idea had been around for a very long time, given that the Golden Gate Strait was over 2,000 meters wide with treacherous waters, it had never been feasible to actually construct a bridge. An expert determined that the challenges involved were simply insurmountable. But then a serious proposal for the construction of the bridge appeared in the San Francisco Bulletin, and the city engineer estimated that the cost would be over $100 million, which is equivalent today of around $2.3 billion. And he asked whether the bridge could be constructed for less. Now, as we know and have discussed on this channel at length, the PRINCE2 method is broken down into seven core principles the first of which being continued business justification. And this principle essentially ensures that every project an organization undertakes will provide a net benefit to that organization that's aligned with its own objectives. Essentially, is the project justifiable for the organization? And up until 1916, the Golden Gate Bridge concept was just too expensive to even entertain the idea of. The costs and risks of building the bridge simply outweighed the benefits, and thus, it was never a viable option. Enter Joseph Strauss, an ambitious engineer who had previously pitched the idea of a 55 mile railroad bridge that would cover the Beirut Strait. And Strauss promised that he could build a bridge across the Golden Gate Strait for as little as $25 million. And this proposal drastically altered the cost benefit evaluation. For the first time, the bridge was both justifiable and plausible. And in the summer of 1921, Strauss submitted his designs for a symmetrical cantilever suspension hybrid bridge. While these designs were reviewed by city officials, he began to promote the idea of the bridge to the public of Northern California. His mission was to convince civic leaders that the bridge was both possible and affordable. And he said that the bridge could be paid for by toll fees alone. Strauss worked day and night to gain support from countless people whose buy-in was critical for the project's success. Strauss travelled throughout Northern California promoting the bridge to communities that would be impacted. Thank you, disembodied voiceover. Strauss's efforts paid off. When his plans were approved by the city and released to the public in 1922, there was very little opposition. Around this time, motor vehicles were becoming more and more common, so the pressure that was put on the ferry system was becoming overwhelming. And these factors ensured that there was a continued business justification for the construction of the bridge. The congestion and the delays that this was causing helped to sway the public opinion towards the construction of the bridge and outweigh their concerns about the cost. Over the next several years, Strauss and his team worked to secure funding, obtain permits, source materials, and workers before finalizing the bridge design. During this time, there were many discussions among this team around the quality of the foundational rock on either side of the strait. The US Navy, for instance, voiced loud concerns that the bridge wouldn't be high enough to allow certain ships to pass, which could prove to be a concern for the country's defense. And the ferry companies who were very much against the construction of the bridge began a long legal procedure designed to block and delay the construction process. And although none of these issues really affected the business justification behind the construction of the bridge, they did slow down the progress. And real work didn't actually begin on the bridge until 1933. And this delay of over a decade wasn't wasted by Strauss. He spent that time not only relentlessly campaigning for the construction of the bridge, but also studying the geography of the Golden Gate Strait in order to refine his design. By 1932, additional geodetic surveys and engineering studies, plus advancements made in the science of bridge building itself, prompted Strauss to make some modifications and deletions. 
the most significant change was to substitute a full suspension design for his original cantilever suspension plan. Now, Prince 2 projects are broken down into unique sequential steps called management stages. And these management stages are similar in many ways to agile sprints. Here's a full definition of management stages. Definition, management stage. The section of a project that the project manager is managing on behalf of the project board at any one time, at the end of which the project board will wish to review progress to date, the state of the project plan, the business case and risks, and the next stage plan in order to decide whether to continue with the project. Now we know that Strauss didn't construct the Golden Gate Bridge using the Prince2 method, but we can still identify these management stages within his work. Because naturally the bridge had to be built in stages, with one piece of work not being able to start until the previous one had been complete. And the first stage of construction actually took place well away from the river because the team had to build an access road that would allow machinery and materials to be transported to the riverside. And once this work was complete, work then began on pier sites, which would eventually connect the span of the bridge to the land. And early construction work on these piers actually revealed measurement mistakes that were made years earlier because the seabed sloped away much more steeply than originally thought. Quoting here, consequently, the length of the center span had to be extended from 4,000 feet to 4,200, with the South Pier located 1,100 feet offshore and the North Pier on the water's edge. Now, because Strauss was working in stages, this new information didn't massively disrupt the project. When he was building the piers, the work on the other parts of the bridge hadn't yet begun. So it was easy to change designs and plans based on the new information that they were presented before work went ahead on those next stages. Fundamentally, by working in stages, Strauss retained his agility. He was able to focus his attention on the current stage and its ensuing difficulties, and then adapt whenever necessary. And this continued as the project progressed. Other changes to the design were made during the project, and Strauss simply adapted to the new information. For example, the total height of the bridge was actually lowered by 100 feet. The cables that supported the bridge had to be increased in diameter from 20 inches to 36 inches. And the the bridge's width was increased and certain features were removed in order to make room for a six lane highway. And some of the decisions made at this time were later abandoned during the project. One important addition to the design made by Strauss called for the erection of pretentious portals at both ends of the bridge. Overhead, spanning the distance between the two pylons would be a monumental gilded wrought iron gate bearing the inscription Golden Gate Bridge. This idea never materialized and it was later abandoned in favor of more functional entrances. Now the Prince 2 stages make these changes and adaptions easier by providing regular review and decision points. And it also encourages management by exception and delaying detailed planning of further stages by as much as possible. The stage plan for the next management stage is produced near the end of the current management stage. The more people involved in planning, the more robust the plan will be. Now, by the end of 1933, the pier on the Marin side of the bridge had been complete, but construction on the San Francisco side of the bridge had been delayed due to adverse weather conditions. And once again, Strauss was forced to adapt. After storms destroyed a large portion of the access trestle, work immediately began on a new, stronger design. And with a few adjustments, the piers on both the Marin and San Francisco sides of the bridge had been completed by 1935. And that's in spite of the extreme difficulties that they'd faced during the process. And next, work began on the two towers that would actually support the structure of the bridge. And work on these towers, although slightly delayed by difficulties with building the Marin Pier, progressed smoothly. And once this stage was complete, the steel cables had to be strung. And the sheer size of the bridge and the difficult conditions under which it was being constructed meant that Strauss had to innovate again. He came up with a system of four carriages that were traveling up and down the height of the towers, releasing cable as they went. And this operation was a success. And then the beginning of the end, the construction of the floor of the bridge, which had been designed to withstand ocean weather. And this began in June 1936. A considerable amount of study had been devoted to building the bridge floor since pressures from the prevailing winds and seasonal storms would cause a considerable amount of side sway plus some up and down motion. Now the bridge floor was built from each end of the bridge at once, slowly progressing their way to meet in the middle. And when the two halves met, several ceremonies were held, which I imagine involved some kind of celebration. However, some of the finishing touches on the bridge were still outstanding. And one of the final aspects of the bridge to be decided upon, which eventually became one of the most famous elements of the bridge as a whole, was its color. Many colors were considered, including black, gray, and red and white stripes. But in the end, this choice was guided by the project's trends of distinctiveness, quality, and simplicity. 
Now, when the steel for the bridge was actually shipped to San Francisco, it had already been coated in a bright orange primer. And the architects decided that this color, which had been designed to be seen through heavy fog and set the bridge apart, was perfect for its final color. They knew such a bold design move would not only be a technical decision, but an emotional one for the bridge's color had helped make it one of the world's most beloved landmarks. Now, all projects have to manage uncertainty and risks. Unmanaged risks can significantly affect a project's outcomes, including whether or not the project itself is a success. And the Golden Gate Bridge project was no exception. Definition, risk management. The systematic application of principles, approaches, and processes to the tasks of identifying and assessing risks, planning and implementing risk responses, and communicating risk management activities with stakeholders. Now, Prince2 outlines four aspects of effective risk management. For risk management to be effective, risks that might affect the project achieving its objectives need to be identified, captured, and described. Each risk needs to be assessed to understand its probability, impact, and timing, so that it can be prioritized. The overall risk exposure needs to be kept under review together with the impact of the risk on the overall business justification for the project. Responses to each risk need to be planned and assigned to people to action and to own. Risk responses need to be implemented, monitored and controlled. Now these four principles of risk management apply to all kinds of risks on all kinds of projects, including the three most common risks for construction projects. That being overspending, delays and health and safety incidents. And the Golden Gate Bridge project fielded risks in each of these areas. But due to Strauss's foresight and planning, the project was completed on time, under budget and with an impeccable safety record. Now in the 1930s, fatalities during construction projects were common, and the general rule was to expect one fatality for every $1 million in cost, which is a lot of, a lot of fatalities in this, in this instance. However, Strauss had an unprecedented attitude towards risk management and felt that these estimates were simply unacceptable. And he planned and implemented many risk mitigation measures. And these measures successfully reduced the risk of death and injury on site. The Golden Gate Bridge project was actually the first in US history to mandate the use of protective equipment, such as hard hats that you see everywhere today. Strauss also made sure that the laborers used safety belts, respirators, gloves, goggles, and sunscreen. The last one might be overkill, poor choice of words. He even set money aside to set up a field hospital that was staffed with medics specifically tasked with treating injured workers. And finally, a huge and expensive safety net was suspended below the bridge, which ultimately saved 19 lives. For the first three years and eight months of the project, no deaths occurred at all. And in the end, 11 people died during the construction of the bridge, but that's far beneath the original expectation. And this is due to Strauss unknowingly following the Prince2 risk management recommendations. In conclusion, the Golden Gate Bridge is the perfect example of an ambitious vision becoming an iconic reality. Because for a very long time, the idea of a bridge spanning across the Golden Gate Strait seemed impossible. However, Strauss's commitment to flexibility, quality, and safety meant that the bridge was delivered not only on time and under budget, but with far fewer safety incidents than anybody expected. And the impacts and benefits of the success of this project can't be overstated. Because of Strauss's exceptional project management, San Francisco became a much more accessible city. This meant that more traffic passed through and more business was brought to the area. Not only did tourism increase dramatically, but the Golden Gate Bridge is now believed to be the most photographed bridge in the world. The Golden Gate Bridge isn't just functional. It's now become one of the most iconic landmarks of the American West, and it never would have existed without effective project management. Now, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see the breakdown of more iconic projects from history in a longer format, just let us know by leaving us a comment. And don't forget to subscribe to the Axos YouTube channel because we're gonna be uploading lots more videos in future. Finally, if you'd like to see the information I've discussed in this video in a written format, you can find a link in the description below. And for now, I'll see you next time. It's a loud siren. <laughs>